In the early years of the 17th century, European economy began to enter into a period of systemic crisis. The crisis moved from the agrarian economy, moving through manufacturing, and generally in the realm of commerce as well. Towards the end of the 17th century, however, Europe had not only recovered from this period of economic downturn, but was a entering into this age of relentless growth that was driven by the merchant capitalists. Europe retained and in fact gained further heights as the center of gravity in the global commerce. But within Europe, center of gravity shifted from the Mediterranean region to the North Atlantic seaboard of the continent. This phenomenon, this shift of the commercial center from the Mediterranean to the North Atlantic seaboard of first Amsterdam to London, and the gradual creation of a world system of commerce is known in the history of Europe and of global history as an age of commercial revolution. In the 16th century, global commerce was dominated essentially by Spain and Portugal with the global trade being controlled in a big way by the Spanish discovery of the Americas, which brought in bullion, gold and silver, but also new crops from the New World, as also the Portuguese entry into Asiatic trade in spices and eventually establishment of a monopoly uh, in this part of the world. By the early 17th century, however, the Spanish and Portuguese colonies had began to gain economic self-reliance and they were trading less and less with the metropolitan region. Around the same time, Britain, France, and Netherlands were beginning to compete for the domination of global trade with Spain and Portugal. And they began to colonize parts of the New World. The Caribbeans, for instance, were almost entirely colonized by the British, French, and the Dutch between the three of them. And the population of the colonies of North America began to increase. Maryland in particular by 1700, showing as many as 275,000 people. There was also a shift in the commodity composition of 17th century trade as against the 16th. In the 16th century, the Portuguese ran a plantation economy in the New World, primarily dealing with trade in sugarcane, uh, which was used for uh, sugar. Uh, driven essentially by slave labor, by enslaving to start with indigenous population, but then bringing slave from outside. In the 17th century, slavery itself became an important component of the intercontinental trade, uh, affecting both the plantation economies and the mining economies of the Spanish colonies of Central America. Plantations increased in number, from around 40 in 1576 to more than 180 in 1710. Sugar mills increased from 60 in 1576 to around 530 in 1710. Sugar production increased from, from over 2,000 tons in 1570 to over 22,000 tons in 1670. This economy of, uh, this plantation economy of Latin America was essentially powered, as I mentioned, by enslavement of the indigenous people. Now, this enslavement of the indigenous people alongside new diseases brought fraught from Europe into the New World happened to decimate indigenous population. The labor shortage that this brought about the, with the endemic uh, situation in essentially terms of smallpox, this shortage was meant to be compensated by a transcontinental slave trade which dominated the 17th century exchange. In 1600, near about 4,000 people were being taken uh, from Africa and sold into slavery in the plantations of America. By 1700, nearly 24,000 people, so almost six times as many people, were being sold into slavery from Africa to America. No less than two million um, people were sold into slavery and shipped to the Americas in course of the 17th century. Initially, it was the Portuguese who dominated the slave trade, but in course of the 17th century, the Dutch began 
uh, became an important player in the slave trade. By the 1670s, the British East India Company also play, began to play a major role. And by 1700, both the British and the French had eclipsed the Dutch. The British and the French were leading the port, no, by the slave trade even into the Portuguese colonies. In the 17th century, there began in the realm of global trade a system of triangular, triangulated system of exchange. Africa supplied the slaves for the plantations of America. America supplied sugar, wax, gold, and molasses to Europe. Europe supplied metallic objects, textiles, guns, and cutlery to both America and Africa. In course of the 17th century, Asia also joined this huge network, which now became quadrangular, sub with Asia supplying Asian manufacturers in return for bullion that was coming from America via Europe. So the, all the known continents in the 17th century world had begun to trade with each other with Europe as its core area and all the other continents functioning as a periphery. This is what Immanuel Wallerstein spoke of the world system of exchange. In course of this emergence of this world system of exchange, the Portuguese made way first for the Dutch and then for the British as the carriers of the Asiatic trade. There was also in course of the 17th century a fundamental change to emerge in the character of the Asiatic trade. Previously, Asiatic trade was dominated by overland trade routes from Asia, which began increasingly to lose significance to the sea route which saw much greater volume being carried almost on a yearly basis. The commodity composition also shifted from almost exclusively spices being exported out um, of Asia. Uh, it declined from 70% to in the beginning of the 17th century to less than 25% of Asiatic, uh, Asiatic exports constitute of prices. And the new commodity that was favored in Europe happened to be textiles, which increased from around 20% to over 50% over the same period of time. In the 1690s, textiles constituted as much as 86% of East India Company's imports, and bullion comprised of around 76% of exports. So East India Company was taking textiles out of Asia and bringing bullion into Asia, which means primarily at this point of time, India. Qualitative change was also to be seen in the nature of the capital mobilized for global commerce in the 17th century. It was no longer possible for any individual capitalist or any single outfit to mobilize capital. The 16th century Spain and Portugal had been dominated essentially by state-led organizations, the Casa de Contratación and Casa de India. In the 17th century, however, it witness, one witnesses the rise of private capital mobilized under joint stock framework operating with royal charters, which is to say the private capital was being underwritten by sovereign government. And the vessels and factories provided with military units to reduce the risk of piracy and brigandage meant that the state involvement was always particularly heavy. The state guaranteed that the vessels and the factories would not have to be dependent 
on local uh, security measures. It was the state that was to provide the military support needed for safety of the merchandise and capital. The 17th century thus began to see there are a shift in the vortex from the Iberian Peninsula to the Atlantic seaboard as this, this marked the age of British dominance, British and Dutch dominance of the high seas. In course of the 17th century, Iberian vessels began to decline in number on the high seas of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. And for the same period, one sees the exponential rise of Dutch, British, and French vessels on the high seas. Dutch trade during this period increased fivefold. British trade increased nearly 60%, but if one factors in the re-exports, then the growth was even larger, and it constituted nearly 30% of total British trade in 1700. So colonial products like tobacco, sugar, and textiles were being brought from America to Europe and then re-exported to some other country at bumper profits. This is what basically fueled British prosperity during the 17th and 18th century. For most of the 17th century, Amsterdam was the vortex of this global capitalist exchange system. Principal economic significance of Amsterdam lay in the fact that it, the, it was the principal entrepot of the Baltic trade in grains, which constituted nearly 36.4% of the 560,000 tonnage of Dutch shipping in 1670, compared to this figure of 36.4%, take the trading volumes with Asia and America, which together made up only 19% of total Dutch trade. In course of the 17th century, agrarian stagnation reduced the volume and value of Dutch Baltic grain trade. And because the Baltic grain trade was where the Dutch gained the largest volumes of surplus in capital, the agrarian decline of the 16th and 17th century gradually then brought about a decline in Dutch Baltic grain trade, and therefore Dutch tonnage fell from nearly two-thirds of the Baltic trade in mid-17th century to less than half by the beginning of the 18th century. The period of Dutch rise and fall in the annals of, uh, of global commerce was also the period when Amsterdam had functioned as the global commercial hub and then gradually made way for London. Amsterdam was the largest center of global capitalism, of global capital in the 17th century. Its population grew from a paltry 30,000 in 1567 to over 200,000 in 1700. The number of commodities traded in the port and markets of Amsterdam increased from 205 in 1585 to over 491 in 1670. 
the first stock exchange to trade in shares on joint stock basis um, also was founded in Amsterdam. And over a period of time, the Dutch institution, the Wisselbank, emerged as the largest clearing house of Europe. That is to say, where bills of exchange from different traders of different continents could be exchanged for cash. And the Wisselbank functioned as this important clearing house activity, displacing gradually Genoa in terms of the number of bills of exchanges cleared. This, in fact, is the clearest indicator that the vortex of commercial gravity had shifted from the Mediterranean to the Northeastern Atlantic seaboard. Almost 30 to 50% of American gold, therefore, immediately upon being brought over into Europe, found its way straight into Amsterdam's Wissel Bank. And foreign governments who were looking to borrow money generally tended to come to Amsterdam because that is where surplus capital was to be found. All through the 17th century, inspired by the example of uh, Amsterdam, British merchants from London began to compete with Amsterdam. In the Caribbeans, the British started trade wars to marginalize Dutch presence through the Navigation Acts of 1651, 1660, 1662, 1669, 1673, and 1696. These were periods of also Anglo-Dutch warfare, not only in the New World, but also in Asia. In course of the 17th century, British shipping, however, increased threefold, which was still smaller than the Dutch, but the doubling of British re-exports between 1663 and 1701 gradually shifted the vortex of global capitalism from Amsterdam to London. Expansion of commercial horizons brought capital from agriculture to commerce, and the city of London began to grow. London Stock Exchange of the 1690s and the foundation of the Bank of England in 1696 reflected this changed reality as London displaced Amsterdam as the global destination of capital. And Europe moved from the age of mercantile capitalism gradually in the direction of industrialization. Thank you.